nice enough to do this. And of course, the conference. I think that the session of yours in the conference, very useful. What we were just talking about that young people can benefit. I think they can benefit a lot from that conversation. So I think that was really nice. So thank you very much, Lela. Thank you. Most welcome. It's a, such a privilege to be here, Vikram. And um, I, I must appreciate all the work that you're doing. I, I do believe it will add meaningfully to the growth of this profession. That's really nice. Nice to say, hear that from you. I, I, I sometimes I just tell people, even Ken, Ken C. Cook says that you're doing so much. I said, what do I do? I just have conversations. <laughs> that's, that's... Communication is the best. That's what is really the issue nowadays. I know. No, it's, I think the fact is because these are informal conversations, I think you get to discuss a lot more rather than on, I mean, you, if, if someone comes prepared, there's a certain agenda and all that. I think that's why maybe we discussed a lot of things, which I don't know. I, I, I feel they have been discussed. I haven't seen them. You've got so, so much more experience, but you haven't been able to see lots of things that I do. So <laughs> that part of it, when will that happen? I don't know. Lele, it can't happen. There are more than 400 videos now. <laughs> <laughs> and it will happen. It will happen. Minimum, the minimum one hour each. I don't know. I think I've got to stop generating more. <laughs> everything has a time, Vikram. But I think that that conference of ours, they, I think the topics and all that people came out with. Because your topic, I feel we should have a separate session on that. Media master mediators at work. I think we should. Maybe it's a can be a series. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we need the master mediators. Yeah. And I mean, most people will never get a chance to see them at work. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, giving a little peep into how the skills are used differently and yet so powerfully. I think, but the interesting thing is that the fact that you pick up what you want to pick up is what has to happen. Because like I was telling you there also, it's not a duplicate Lela that we need. We need to pick up the best that can work for that person. That's, yeah. I think, that differentiation that can people do that? I mean, how they at what stage are they ready for that? So are, I don't know whether actually students at that stage, are they ready for that? Because they will say that, okay, this is what I have to be forgetting that, look, they have the, some things that Leila has will not work for them. So that's about the authenticity in mediation, Vikram. Um, you know, in mediation, the parties come to their vulnerable self. They need to come. They need to come to that vulnerable space where they can be themselves and recreate. For that to happen, for the parties to come to their vulnerable self, the mediator, the intermediary, has to be very authentic. Really important. I think that part is so important. Which I told you, I was telling you, and that, that when we, that when you were discussing master mediators, that is that whole symposium on heart soul spirituality. This was where. We were, I think all of us who were part of that actually had this authentic self part that we discussed. And But what was the authentic self? What is the authentic self? There there were, of course, <laughs> different things that came out. That's your own inner journey. Nobody can tell you what is your authentic self. But if you want that aha moment with your parties, then we have to do our own journey and find ourselves in order to help the parties come to their vulnerable self with you. Absolutely. So sometimes, actually, look. I mean, I mean, all these other symposia and everything that I have, and we, like we had indigenous peoples and mediation right now. How did that go? That was nice. Really interesting. I mean, we, of course, look. This was small. I, I think I'm getting older, which I was saying. It's, it's only there were only about I think 30, 33 or something speakers, and with me, you know, I started off with 97 last year, but. I just said, let's keep it only for that period from 9th August to 31st August. The last one I'd gone for two months. So let's okay. get, I mean, other thing is that the, there's another one coming up starting on 15th September, which is colonization, decolonization and mediation. Mm -hmm. In a way, there was an overlap. 
between the two. It could have continued as part of the same thing, but I wanted to differentiate that because let's look at, even there I was saying that, let's look at the positive sides of indigenous peoples and mediation. And then this negative side that came in and what it did. And you have to be part of that symposium. Lela, I'll fix a time with you because that part of it for me is something that we really need to discuss the colonization aspect of it. And why I put the decolonization, actually Sarah, she's in Australia. She added that earlier, it was going to be colonization and mediation, but the decolonization part also has affected mediation and the way it's going. I mean, I won't get into my criticism of maybe say the mediation bill or anything. That's, that's too specific. That's not the point, but globally, the way decolonization went and how mediation has got affected by that also needs to be discussed. Honestly, when I heard the topic, I was wondering what, what you really meant by it. What is the scope of it? So anyway, that we'll discuss later. But interesting, interesting. No, because the thing is that, I mean, I when I do these things, I put it out as a broad topic and not give it, <clears throat> give it much direction, only to bring out whatever people want to. But a lot of people ask me, okay, what am I supposed to talk about or whatever? I said, look, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to in any way limit your thoughts. This is the topic. <laughs> Go where you want. Because this is, we are discussing it this year. After this, when we do it next year, I mean, I want that to be a larger one. Even indigenous people, I, I have said, this time we had 30 something, it should be 300 next time. Because the, the voices that came out, the thoughts that came out, I realized there is so much out there so much out there which hasn't been looked at and the common thread that comes in from the say an indigenous person from canada was there and someone from australia was there and from africa was there and you find common threads india we had some people from tribal communities in india so you saw the common thread but also found out that there hasn't been too much of a deeper search into what's happening People have just broadly, okay, this dispute resolution is happening. And of course, arbitration and mediation gets gets merged there. What is really happening there? So we need to also dig deeper as part of that. Because I don't want to say that, oh, indigenous people only did mediation. No, if they were not doing it, they were not doing it. And if, if they were not doing it, what are the reasons for that? So there are lots of, I think, discussions around that that need to happen. Because I don't know, I mean, what your thoughts on that? I, I, we should have been part of that indigenous peoples and mediation also. Either, but you can tell us your thoughts here. This is a good good chance. <laughs> you know, essentially, I believe mediation happens when an intermediary is able to hold the space of conflict. In all human interactions, there, there, there is there is a you know there is a pattern. In fact, I, uh, the mystics talk about order, disorder and reorder. That's a pattern. So in human interactions, whether you are tribal, indigenous, um, Indian, American, African, it doesn't matter. But in human interactions, there is that order. Some Often there, there comes a disorder. And then how do we get back to reorder? So, and in order to get back to reorder, often there is a third side, a third side to conflict. And that's what mediation is about. It's about the third side. I, I, I really like the uh, story of, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a real situation. William Urey talks about the, the Third Side, the book. Mm -hmm. uh, he's written this book, Third Side. And he refers to the African tribe where uh, they're, they're hunters by profession. And they all walk around with a bag of arrows on their back. So 
in that community, the moment there is a disagreement, somebody will go and take their bag of poison arrows and hide it. And then everybody is brought back. The, the parties involved are brought and the community, many of them sit together and they talk and they talk until they find a solution. It can go on for days, uh, or, you know, but till they find a solution. And sometimes if they are not able to find a solution, these people are sent away, the parties who are, who are disagreeing are sent away for a cooling off period. And, and then to think of creative ideas and then they are brought back. And again, there is talking and talking to find a solution. Isn't that mediation? We as uh, mediators, as a third side. So what uh, William Urey says is every member in the community has a responsibility to be a third side. The moment there is a disagreement, the community has to create the space for intermediaries to help parties talk, help parties uh, cool off. These are basic principles. And I think this is what we are doing in mediation as well. You find it among the tribal, indigenous, among uh, communities, operations. The principle is the same. When there is a disagreement, bring them to a conversation, communication, build that communication, use techniques to help them cool off, think of new ideas. So that is my thought for reorder. When disorder happens, bring them back to reorder instead of taking them to violence, fermenting trouble. So I look at it that way. I mean, so, so in that chain of it's a simplistic approach, but honestly, I believe that's what it is all about. So that's interesting. So there's going to be order, disorder, reorder, and then we'll talk about the disruptor. Which is that colonization? <laughs> That's where the disruptor aspect comes in, and whether that has changed things. Of course, but the little we've gone into the wrong direction. You have to tell us about yourself, and as much, I, I would say everything about yourself, but as much, please. That's where we should have started from. Well, uh, what do you want to know about me, Vikram? Everything, wherever you want to start, and we can go backwards, forwards, whatever. We can take our time. But let's understand. I mean, let's get to know you, right? Right from maybe look as as much back as in time that you want to take us. I'm, I'm happy. Well, uh, if you look at me professionally, I was a lawyer for um, now. It's been I think 30, 35 years, and uh, I was practicing in the High Court and in the Supreme Court. Um, well, to, related to mediation, it was in 2006 when the Chief Justice of Karnataka invited me to be um, the coordinator of the Bangalore Mediation Center. And of course, one, you don't say no to me, uh, to the Chief Justice. Secondly, um, I thought I was just committing to a few hours. I really didn't know what mediation was, but when I heard the concept, I remember this is Markanda Kanju had come to uh, the Karnataka High Court and he spoke about mediation. And when I heard about mediation, what it really, the principles that he had put out, something tugged at my heart. But anyway, I really didn't know more about it. Then um, I, I accepted to be the coordinator, thinking that I'm giving up only a few hours of my week, and that's my payback. But it really didn't happen that way. Within a few years, I, I really felt that I am in a space where I'm holding a uh, the key to the secret of peace. Mm -hmm. There is a key to the secret of peace in mediation. Um, and 
that's when I really started reflecting, journeying with each of the of the mediations that I did. And uh, slowly I started understanding what conflict really was. Honestly, Vikram, in my 25 years as a lawyer, I really didn't understand conflict. I, I just, you know, understood my client and what for my client's interest. But what is conflict? Two sides to the conflict. Whether it's husband and wife, or it's um, two countries, or two communities, there are two sides. And they reach a situation where they are not able to resolve it themselves. They've fallen off the path for resolution. There's a lot of emotion. And how do we bring them back to resolution, to conciliation, to communication, get them from conflict to communication, to conciliation? I, I thought, that is a, a key secret. If, if we can help the parties in, in, the, in the mediations that I did, I just realized that if parties can be helped to stop fighting, take a pause, listen to each other, understand where each one is coming from, remind them that they did have common grounds. When they started off, there was order in their lives. And now there is disorder. Just remind them of the consequences. What happens if you continue professionally, personally, financially, health-wise? Show them, although they know all this, parties in conflict are very smart people. But I do understand when there is conflict, there is uh, selective attention. We, we all know, mediators, we know selective attention. Our mind gets frozen on, on winning rather than many of the important aspects. So if there is a neutral, an intermediary who can help them focus on the impact of this, the long-term effect of this, then they themselves come back into a resolution. So these kind of, you know, I, I really felt I was, um, I was getting into something much larger than what I thought I was getting into. And, and that's how I, I really, in 2015, decided to um, move into mediation full time. And I, you know, coincidence, uh, it was around this time I was also beginning get, to get frustrated with litigation and the adversarial processes. Um, I just felt, you know, High Court, Supreme Court, we rely on the same paragraphs in the judgment, keep urging the same things. And how many times I was getting a little frustrated. I was seeing my, the, my clients really remaining in status quo for many years. If not status quo, conditions were deteriorating. Uh, there was one particular moment when I saw a, a client of mine for whom I did a pro bono case. Her husband died in, in an um, accident. And then she comes 15 years later saying, this is when I finally got the award which you got for me. And now it doesn't mean anything to me. And then I realized, what am I doing with my life? I, I really don't need to do this. There was not, there was the, the meaning. I, and at that stage in my life, I mean, there were things that happened. I had a very great uh, personal tragedy in my life. I lost my son and I couldn't be doing things that didn't have a meaning, that didn't have a purpose. And mediation, I thought, was really giving me 
meaning and purpose. Uh, and that's how I moved into mediation full time. It, it, it really has kept me engaged. And to, when I thought initially that I was giving a few hours of my time to the courts, I was mistaken. Today, I give 24 hours a day to mediation. Yeah, right. that's, that's what it is. I'm really sorry about to hear about your son. I mean, we won't talk about it, but I'm sure that must have been a very, very major turning point. It can be a turning point or whatever, I'm sure. But those are things which we don't want as turning points, for sure. But life takes us. We don't know how, when. But but what about Lela before she became a lawyer? Have we gone into that part? Because look, I tell you, there is another series of mine, which is in the evolution of a mediator. Too, you're too young to be on that. Because I'm, I'm sorry, but you're too young for that because that's 70 plus. So you're not there. I'm not asking you your age, but you're not there. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you think so. So that's why I'm not going there. But that is where we I get into, of course, childhood and growing up and all that. So I'm not going to probe into that. But there I probe. And there I like to find out everything. But here it's not probing. But please tell us about those years, that aspect of life. Before I became a mediator? Before you even became a lawyer, maybe before you went to school, I'm, I'm happy <laughs> for that period also. <laughs> well, uh, Vikram, I um, born to uh, in a family where my, my father was a lawyer. My uh, mother was a mathematic uh, MSc in maths of those years. Every free child went to a boarding school very early in life because my parents went abroad. Um, studied in uh, in Kodekanal, Presentation Convent Kodekanal is a hill station in South India and did my uh, uh, my college in Salamaris, did economics. Never was excited about economics. Mm, I did it. I did my MA economics also. After which I um, met this wonderful man who I married and um, three children. You know my daughter Tara, uh, who's also a lawyer and mediator. A son who is uh, working with in my husband's firm. So uh, honestly, I, I would say that it was not money that drove me in my professional life. It was always something, a, a larger cause. Having said that, today Bangalore is drowning. Uh, our, our lakes have breached. And I must tell you that in my litigation career, I filed a, a, a PIL and saved a lake, a 14 acre lake for my community. And uh, at a, um, I think it's a five acre park for my community, which today we all enjoy. It's very close to my home. So I, I've always enjoyed the, uh, the larger costs. Um, I also work with persons with mental illness uh, for five years. I became a member of their self-help group and filed several PIs in the courts and got some amazing outcomes, all believing in the power of collaboration. So I worked with the, the government, the uh, self-help groups, the, um, the, the actual um, persons with mental illness, their caregivers, uh, the medical community, and we got some amazing outcomes through that. So I was a kind of, you know, what inspired me was very good causes. And, and I used a lot of my legal um, training towards that, or minority rights, those kind of things excited me. Um, 
What else do I tell you about my? You already. I'm mean, look. This is like you got you given us a trailer. This is like a Netflix trailer. We are going to go into each of those aspects. It's interesting. Right? That whole, I mean, that whole uh, boarding school. Could I can analyze a place is a very nice place. So you're going to tell us about th- that part. I mean, that's really something which. I mean, I, I don't know. Look, the fact is that that period yeah. also. It's... In in boarding schools, we all do the same things. We make friends. We have midnight feasts. We have. Mm-hmm. Uh, um i it was it was a good time and uh, well what more do you want to know about my the boarding school itself is by it's an episode by itself we can cover <laughs> there was i mean i mean you look you growing up with that i'm not i know i'm sure when you look back of course the highlights are there in your mind but if you look at into that the person that you are how that helped you be who you are today because that's why i do that evolution of a media to series because even the person doesn't realize sometimes that how those aspects of their life whatever they've gone through actually make you what you are and that's when the whole concept which i of course keep talking about you don't make mediators it's so much that goes into them to be who they are so let's just, i mean let's just go back and let, okay let's just look at those things which might be things which today as who you are as a mediator what are those things we can pick up from there let's pick up let's go back and pick up from each aspect of childhood and growing up and everything let's pick up that let's be interesting Well, I, I think my boarding school. I, you know, I'm grateful to the Irish nuns. They uh, they instill a lot of lot about me, honest, um, integrity, and um, so. And of course, you know, a discipline, keeping to time. All those things were very much part of what growing. I mean, it was a convent school, a, a Christian. Convent school, Irish presentation order. Um, by the way, the um, uh, we had uh, Yashodra Sindhya as my classmate, the Rajmata's daughter, and many wonderful people in our class. Um, but what I liked about the nuns is at, at least one real um, something that I learned was the importance of honesty. And a simple example. um i remember we you know body school everybody is hungry we are all raiding the orchards uh, there were some pear orchards uh, in our school so a few months down the line after i joined the school this nun comes up to the study hall and she says all those who have been raiding the orchards during the past three months please stand up and i was amazed you know by, by then i i was in class 9 i had just joined the school and all those who actually raided the orchard during the past 3 months stood up and i was really impressed by that kind of honesty that's one of the things that i learned from that school mm-hmm. to be absolutely honest So that's a really important thing that you come. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a very. Yeah. I mean, important aspect of, again, th- that authentic self. I think when we will. I think what we do is after you've told us all about this, then we'll build an authentic self. Then we'll. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the things that, and of course, very um, nice things. And there were many things that were not so good. Either. It's always better for children to be at home. but um, really that that was something that i learned from that school you know i think even the fact of interacting with people from all over and you are now in a space where you have to maybe get along i don't know how how that well, those dynamics work you have to tell me i haven't been to a residential school so how do that how does that those dynamics work Inter, interpersonal well, and all well it was a diverse group we had North Indians and South Indians, and we had um, Irish children and English children. It was a a, a good mix, uh, which helped me to see the humanity in everybody. Initially, it was not easy. My what I was used to uh, was very different to the, some of the things that they did and said. 
but slowly to realize that everybody has their own way of doing things and that's okay. And to be able to live with a group of people and um, become part of another community uh, was a great learning. So I, I, I really did enjoy and learned many things that I didn't uh, know earlier, um, you know, participating in gymnasium and in uh, debates and all that. It was a new experience. So that's one part of my uh, boarding school. But of course, I went to boarding school even earlier at the age of five when my parents went abroad. Um, my father did his, um, his doctorate in, uh, in The Hague. And at that time, I, as, a, as a five and a half year old child, I went to boarding school. That was another experience where one felt totally lost. And, uh, um, but came out of it for three uh, years I was there. Yeah. At that time, that must be like a little too young for you to even, even I think, understand what's happening, I'm sure. I mean, absolutely, that's... absolutely. And to some extent, looking back, I, I just believe there is a, 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 a positive that comes out of every situation. Yeah. Of course, even in conflict, there is a creative energy in conflict. Similarly, there is a, a, a creative energy in those difficult situations. That, uh, maybe going that early is what taught me to be independent. Exactly. I think that's everything. I, I, I mean, let's just say, like you always hear, everything happens for the best. And the fact is that that is what happened. Now, anyway, we should take it as a positive. But I'm sure just the fact that you're saying that at that age, at five, to be dealing with people on a one-to-one -one basis with no one out there to really look at things for you, uh, the way I say, a mother is there to do, do that for children. So that must have been yeah. interesting. You, you, you learn through mistakes. You, you do stupid things and learn through that. So maybe that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. but, but how many siblings were you? Two siblings, my sister and myself. And uh, uh, yeah, we, we just two. And I'm, I'm very close to my sister. Was so younger or older? She's two years older. Yeah. yeah. So you were the younger one. So you were taken care by the by Your sister also went to the, the boarding yes, school. Yes. So, so then you had someone. Were like two peas in a pod. Um, you know, she's two years older than me. And uh, every year I remember the, there would be a little confusion on when exactly was my birthday. So one year she would say it is on 22nd February. Next year she'll say it's 23rd February. And we celebrated whichever day she thought was the right day. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, but at least you had her to take care of you. In a way, you had someone there in the school. taking care of it. We were almost the same age. Yeah. No, but at that age, two years is a long time. I mean, it's yeah, like yeah. Oh, much yeah, I, older. Yes. Because I think as you go become older, two years means nothing. But it, as yeah, within those yeah. periods, there's so much change that happens in children. Yeah. So I'm sure. Yeah. I was five when she was seven. Yes. But that's I think that I mean, I'm just thinking, what is a child looking? I mean, this is the fact that I, I'm just thinking that five years old in this environment. How do you cope with that? I mean, I'm just, I, I can't even imagine what that is for you. What was that for you? But how did, how did that work? Vikram, you build your resilience. You go through everything that life offers. And, and it all builds up to something else. So, no, yeah, but you, I was lost. Uh, then I found it. I found myself. So I did. It was all fine. Then they came back after my parents came back after three years. Mm. So I see them after three years, okay? And um, yeah, my, I enjoyed my parents. My father passed away when, um, when I was about 38 years old. So, and my mother, she lived with me for many years after that. And she also has passed away. So I, I did have a good relationship with my parents. I, I'm grateful for that with my sister. Uh, of course, I, I do realize, I mean, especially I think one of the great things that mediation has taught me is life is a mixed bag. Everybody has a bit of good, a bit of not so good. Definitely. 
okay. yeah, imperfections, the imperfections of life. That, that's really something that um, I would say mediation taught me. But but all this about boarding schools that you see maybe sometimes in movies and series and all about how children deal with each other the, uh, is that I mean are the are good things happening or bad things happening to children what what really happens there? Well, I think children with parents is the best. But there was a concept earlier. I I wonder if there are so many children going to boarding school. But those days, you know, there weren't so many good schools in, in the city or the town that you were in, uh, and you go to a boarding school. In, in, incidentally, the school that, the boarding school that I went to, uh, the nuns shut it down, and, and now it's become a, a day school. Uh, because I think the nuns themselves realize there's no point taking children away from their homes. So I do believe children should grow up in their homes. But there is a lot that you learn in body schools also. You learn to you know, adjust to different people, different kinds of food, um, different cultures. You, you definitely see the richness of so many cultures. Um, and yet, essentially, everybody is the same. So there is a sort of, certain leveling that happens there. Um, at the same time, there is a vacuum which only parents can fill. Definitely. No, but, but being nice to each other or not being so nice to each other, the children between themselves, does that happen? I mean, how? Because these are young people, they don't really, I mean, they're doing what they're doing. But are they not so nice to each other? Is that Does that really happen or is it just a movie thing? Yeah. I went to a girls' school, all girls' school. So it, it, it's, I don't think I faced any kind of harassment. Or maybe I, I'm, I'm that kind of a person. I remember somebody uh, interviewed me at uh, many years ago and asked me how it was to be a woman lawyer. And I said, you know, honestly, I don't see the difference. Man or woman, I'm just a lawyer. So I, I, I have a kind of personality maybe that I just focus on what on, on my track, I, I can find any any kind of harassment. I, I was quite comfortable. No, but this is very important what you just said because just the fact that someone even asks you that, I mean, there is no difference. I mean, you are you who you are. You're not thinking about this aspect, which is important. A lot of people do think about all that and then they look yeah. at life from that perspective. But yeah. definitely, I think that's important. I mean, we'll be putting it down. I think I don't know. Maybe have I made a list? I should be putting a list. But th these. I think the little, little things are what makes a person who they are, but they're not looking at, oh, I'm being discriminated against, oh, I'm nothing. This, I am a person, I'm dealing with someone as a person, and the person should deal with me as a person, not, oh, I'm a woman, so I'll be treated like yeah. this. Or a, I yeah. think that's interesting. I think that's a yeah. that's important. Even as a mediator, I, I don't, uh, I mean, so often I've sat in a room with all men, but I never found that as something which is uncomfortable. I never did. And I didn't, at least maybe I didn't notice, I didn't see um, any kind of difference among my parties either. Though I know that some parties choose a male mediate. That I know. And that's their comfort level. I think, I think we need to, I think, dig a little deeper into why that happens because I'm saying a lot of that is it going to be connected to, is it going to be connected to colonization there, that the whole setup there was made in a certain way, that structure. I, I don't know because, I, I mean, how that happened, why, say, even all over the world, this whole thing, lawyers and male lawyers, and I hear people talk about this, that, okay, this is the boys club and the men's club or whatever they want to call it everywhere in, in the, in the, I mean, legal profession, of course, in the, in the mediator part of it, they, 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 I mean, it's coming down as a trickle effect of that because lawyers have moved into being mediators in most part of the world. And the same thing continued there because there, there are people who've come into my show who've spoken about this aspect in their countries that this is what they feel discriminated against. So, well, I, I, I know that as a woman mediator, I have to be at least twice as good as a male mediator to be taken seriously. And I make it a point. 
that, that really I mean, that, that's how it is i mean that at, at that point in human awareness development where there there possibly is an advantage to be a male so i have to be twice as good i know that i think that's why we need to go into why that happens because if you have to change that aspect because i feel i'm on the other side i feel that women will make better mediators i mean maybe i am i don't know is i maybe is it a reverse bias there people would say because everyone talks about it. but i just feel i'm look i connected to being a mother and when when a child i mean my mother knows how to take care of the child same feel there those everything those feelings and everything that comes there's a natural things i think when a, a dispute comes to a mediator i'm not saying it has to be a woman i'm saying the motherly instincts and being the the woman side of a man can also come out i mean I, I, that part of it but i think we have to go to those elements and i think women will be better at handling that and but i'm saying the mediation that i want to promote look the court related part of it i don't even touch i don't even i mean that's a world that exists but for me i don't know if that, whether that should exist so that's another area but the kind of mediation that i am talking about which i had put out actually on my website also this i'm creating this world mediation circle which is a network or a i mean it's a i think I mean, let's call it just a circle within circles within circles kind of thing so down to creating a mediation circle in every school every community and issue based mediation circles we'll have a global climate change mediation circle and down to a community level uh, uh climate change mediation circle so everyone is part of the larger part but of course they're looking at their circle and what has to happen there so those that's the larger thing so what i did put the put down there or i said maybe maybe i can just put it up i'll just show you because those are the those are elements which sometimes i feel are not being discussed so i mean what i said was i just read out from there i i won't put it up so okay i mean i i could i, I can tell you but i'll read it out there because it's actually there creating mediation circles to bring a moral values principles and ethics based humanistic approach to dispute resolution where heart soul spirituality play an important role in relation to the mediator i have the peacemaker the participants i'll talk about that so that's the kind of mediation i'm talking about and in that mediation i think these elements and what a woman would bring in i think are important and well, vikram you know i have seen excellent male mediators and female mediators so i i i'm really not inclined to say one is better than the other but i definitely agree that parties have their preferences okay. so, some some people ask for a uh, a woman mediator some ask for a uh, a man and and that's their preference they are entitled to it. but personally i feel a good mediator works from the soul from the spirit and and i i kind of forget that i am a woman i i i'm just a mediator at that point similarly when i was a lawyer i i really didn't keep in mind the fact that i was a woman i kept in mind that i was a lawyer and i had to do what i need to do to the best of my ability and i always you know i, I i'm not i'm uh, i was a lawyer who didn't take on too many cases but the cases that i took on i worked very hard at it and you know did a lot of research and went deeply into it which kind of helped me always um so that's what i gave importance to yeah no but i think that we have to of course this is something i'm sure someone is researching this but yeah. like i said that the these elements which might be connected to women but i'm saying even in men those elements will exist i mean where like yeah. we have our that ardhanareshwar concept in exactly. shiva and the, the man exactly. and the woman part of it so that's part yeah. of what our what we you know as a mediator that there, there has to be there are moments when i have to become strong and firm and handle the situation draw the boundaries and yet there are times when as a mediator i have to be 
compassionate and um, calming and soothing. So in one mediation, the same person adopts so many avatars, as you rightly said, Ardhana is it, it just that that's the uh, process. Yeah. You you uh, in fact in my opening statement I tell them you know in my opening statement I'm nice, but there will be times during the mediation when I become tough, and it's done to pull you out of the ditch. You need to get back to a productive negotiation. I need to pull you out. That's part of my job. So I might not be so nice. I say okay. that. Yeah, I think Lela, I think you need to write write something on this Ardhanareshwar and the mediator part of it. Because maybe when we look at litigation, maybe the male elements are what are coming out and the the women, the female elements are not coming out there, which are important here, which people might not understand because of the fact, like I said, that lawyers are whom you go to for dispute resolution. And of course, this, this colonization thing which I'm building is that courts are where you go and lawyers are the one who take care of dispute resolution on the larger level. So that goes down then if you come into the mediation thing and it being connected to the courts. I think that aspect has to be something which I think people have to move away from. But how, the, how that will happen, I think we'll, I don't know how, how we'll build it up because we are, I mean, of course, you, like you said, you were part, you are part of the mediation center part of the courts and how that has affected mediation i don't know if there's some research happening on that are they is feedback taken is, is feedback taken from these people who are part of the process there i mean we always did at the bangalore mediation center and today at cam yes we take feedback from everybody and i, I don't see this um, male female uh discrimination I, I do see it in a choice of a mediator. Mm -hmm. People choose some some parties choose a mediator. But, but the one thing that we're going to do is on the terminology part of it, which I, I don't know whether I spoke to you in the conference. There was a session on mediation and terminology. And Jeannie came out with interesting things because she works with, I told you about that, that about the, in community mediation, let's call them participants. But whether when we talk about mediation coming from the court system, whether we should still refer to them as parties or not, we'll have to look at, but looking at yeah, them as participants. Know, I, yeah. it, ideally, that's perfect. I mean, that, that, that's uh, ideally, yes, we shouldn't be talking to them, talking about uh, uh, the parties in mediation as parties, we should call them participants. I think that's a perfect situation. Yeah. But of course, you know, we tend to slip. And yeah. I, I'd be happy to be corrected on it. Yeah, they I are participants. And not so, like even if, I mean, she said that you, if, if the opening statement terminology has been used because it has come out from the court system, why yeah. do we have to do that? Let's talk about yeah. orientation. I told you about that part. So yeah, I found that it, interesting. It's, it's very good. It's maybe better to call it orientation. I, I, I fully respect those uh, terminologies. Let, let's call it orientation and let's call uh, participants, let's, um, the people involved are persons. And, but you know, this is what happens to our human brain. It's uh, for years and years as lawyers, we had parties and as mediators, we could talk about parties, but I, I, I stand corrected. It should be participants and persons and orientation. Yeah, sometimes I think sometimes terminology makes a lot of difference in religion. Yes. I mean, how they perceive people who are coming in, they perceive it as still something connected to that process, course, which they are. Yes. So I think maybe yeah. I mean, I'm sure absolutely it makes sense. Right, absolutely right. I, I, I do agree with that. But only thing, Lela, now the thing is that one is the serious Lela that we have in front of us. And then we were back to childhood. What was that Lela doing? I mean, we, so, okay, we've heard about it. We said boarding school. But then what's, what are the activities there? What is, like you said, gymnastics is one part of it. Is there a lot of, a lot of sports happening there? I mean, yeah, we have, you know, honestly, I, I, I used to take part a little bit in um, athletics. I used to run for my school team. Um, but I was not a great athlete. My children were. They would always uh, take part in a lot of sports activities and do very well with it. Um, uh, but I, I was not exceptionally good at it. Um, so um, 
I, I must confess, I had a lot of fun in college. We um, enjoyed ourselves, studied a little bit of economics, uh, took part in some extracurricular activities, but nothing. Um, no, I think Lela, you'll have uh, to you'll have to expand. I, I was not top of the sports field. I did fairly well in, in class uh, academically, and um, but it was a lot of fun and enjoy. I enjoyed myself. But number one thing now you'll have to expand on lots of extracurricular activities as much as you want to tell us, as much as you want to expand on that. <laughs> it isn't. It isn't. It isn't extracurricular activities. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I, I was in a hostel. And um, enjoyed the weekends, saw lots of movies, read books, um, did a little bit of economics. And um, in fact, I really enjoyed my legal education. That, and I did that when I had my children. It was something that I did along with bringing up my three kids. I, I did uh, no. both my LLB and my LLM, I did while bringing up my three children. And the day my youngest uh, son went to school, I, I took him to his class and then joined law firm. So I, I, I gave a lot of importance to my role as a mother. I um, stayed at home, took time off to take my, uh, to look after my children. And only when they all went to school, did I get back to work. Um, I started life as a banker, mm -hmm. uh, didn't enjoy it. Um, and uh, then that's when I started law studied uh, my law LLB and LLM in mercantile law and uh, I worked with King and Partridge mm -hmm. and uh, then started my own legal practice. Okay. Okay. So that means the legal education happened later. I mean that you came, you joined your LLB yeah. much later. Much later. Yeah, much later. After I, after, uh, I had my so um, I started, when I uh, left work to uh, start a family, that's when I start, I studied for law. Okay. And, was... and those days, we didn't, attendance was not so important. If yeah. you did law in my period of time, uh, attendance was not so important. So somehow we managed the family and study and do my exams and that's how I did. Uh, people would not know also that the fact that that time it was you finish your graduation and then you went into yes. uh, studying. That, that's absolutely a little... you're right. When I finished my BA economics, I told my father, you know, I'm not really interest, uh, excited about economics, so let me start law. And he said, no, <laughs> the Kerala Law College may not be the best place for you, so go back for MA economics. So I went back for MA economics. And um, I finished my MA economics, got married. That's when I started law. I think, but I think one of those things that it's just an enjoyable read. I mean, just to study law. I mean, I, know, I think everyone should have that as part of whatever education they have. It's, it's a nice to just go read about it. About and it's, if you get a little more involved, it becomes even more interesting. But I don't think at that time law colleges were. I mean, here at least in India, were not going that in depth. It was more about examinations. I I don't know about your experience in college. Well, law college was not at least when I was there. Uh, it was not the most inspiring places to be. But I, I was inspired by the subject. And uh, to some extent, you know, I, I was very um, excited by the, the right and wrong, uh, justice. It, it really took me mediation to understand that justice has no clear boundaries. But as a, before mediation, I was very much the, the polarized vision. And uh, 
it's after my mediation awareness that I, you know, I saw the word more whole. Other, otherwise, I, I was really excited by the, the law and the justice and, and to, to go into a case and, and find arguments for my client and to prove that the other was wrong it was very exciting for me. But I'm just going, I mean, digressing a bit. I mean, because you said you had filed some PILs public interest litigation for people who do not know. Interestingly, now I see that judges are putting some kind of costs on people who are filing PILs. I'm finding that very sad. I mean, just the fact that you're going to put some fear in someone's mind to approach court in a in a writ petition under either, either three, uh, th Article 32 or 226, any of them. I mean, I, is that the correct approach? So I, I, I really find it quite sad. Well, Vikram, I think there has been misuse also. So then it becomes a waste of the court's time. Fortunately, earlier those, uh, they, they did, they were, they were kind to uh, allow those petitions. And um, yeah, some of this, it, it, um, I got excellent orders in many of them. So I, I do believe that they, they served a purpose. Yeah. Well, well, there, there is a misuse. And now the courts have, are very skeptical. What, what is it bona fide? Is it well researched? Each time you do a PIL, the kind of research that one does is has to be very extensive. So I, I would take, you know, I'd have research assistants. I would spend a large part of my time working for um, these uh, courses, whatever it is. And as a result, I would say I have a 100% um, um, outcome in all the PIMs that I find. Well, I tell you, in, in that session of yours in colonization, decolonization, we'll discuss it because I'm just looking at it from if you're saying that, of course, these, these courts, these judges are all overburdened with work and they feel that you are wasting our time and we have time to do, we have to use that time for something else. But we started off with that concept that a letter sent by someone can be treated as a PIL kind of thing, that approach to down to this level that we will decide whether this is something that we need to look at. I do understand looking at the bona fide, which they've done earlier. They've told people, I mean, I've seen by the court itself that, okay, do you want to withdraw this? Otherwise, we are passing this order or whatever. They used to, they put fear in people's mind. We're still that colonial concept. But here, the whole thing was that we had this, as, this is part of a constitutional framework. The whole concept of putting it there, as I would understand, is that people who otherwise the bureaucracy or whatever other things they're affected by, they had an approach to the court available to us in a simple way. But I think that's going totally going around the whole concept behind it. I feel it's, and who was going to interpret it? The judges. Now you have created this whole world within a world, an opaque world. I think that they, we need to start questioning it and you are the best person to do it. So first I have to convince you, then, I, then it'll happen. But I think we can't take it. I don't think you should take it lightly because you've worked on it and you have seen the benefits. Now, some judge, we, we know that judges are not the best in terms of gauging things. That's why we have appeals. Otherwise, we would not have appeals. They have their, their, they have their limitations, they're human. So if that person to gauge whether this is a genuine case or not is, I think, getting too much into making a prima facie case against something. I think it's I think it's not fair on various issues which will not come to court now because a person would have that fear, which is fair that I might well, look. I mean, if we have put down sometimes let me let me put it in dollars, sometimes ten thousand dollars. They've gone up to I was there was someone was telling me in one of those sessions in the in my guess, symposium. It was something like I think. About I think fifty thousand dollars or something like that, or one that maybe more as costs because you approach the court in relation to a fundamental right. Otherwise, you've just finished off that whole concept. I don't know how how you look at it. I mean, whether you really looked at it as that or not, because I just feel that we may be going in the wrong direction. See, Vikram, we are in a space where we have moved from order to disorder. 
even in our court system. I mean, I mean if as you rightly said, judges are human beings. They are struggling. It's time for reorder. It's time. I do agree. But, 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 I, I, I believe that mediation is one, one way of reordering, where judges have more time and they can apply their minds to the right cases in the right way, mindful, mindful decision making. I'm going to do how I put the, the reorder part of it. Of course, like I said, mediation in the court system, I'm a, I, I criticize to whatever. But I, I mean, I won't do it here because I've done this so many times. But all I said in terms of reorder, let the Chief Justice of India go on to media, whatever, national media, whatever he can find everywhere, and just fold his hands and just apologize to the people that we have not served you. We are denying justice because justice delayed is justice denied. Please don't come to us. Come at your own risk of time, cost, whatever, peace of mind, everything. Come only then. We just can't service you. We are an institution which has come from the colonizers. It's a colonizer's institution and we've kept it there. We are at that level where we, like we're opaque. You know how opaque that whole system is and how judges are appointed and all that. You, of course, you know. A lot of people will find it really amusing maybe. Or I don't know, however, what way they will look at it, that that opaqueness can, can happen in a country which is supposed to be a democracy, where some people who are not accountable to the people directly can decide who's going to be the judge in a Supreme Court. I mean, that's like to a different level altogether. So let them go and apologize and just say, we can't, we can't deliver justice. And please use mediation because that's an option that you have or whatever other way you can resolve your dispute, because this is really not going to get you anywhere. And at the end of the day, 20 years of your life might go. And what has happened? There was one case, I mean, I, mean, I did not get into reading it totally, about this guy who was convicted and put on the death sentence. And finally, after I think 10 years or 14 years, the Supreme Court acquitted him. Can you imagine? Uh, so you, someone you thought could should deserves the death penalty lives and that fear for so many years and then you acquit the person what kind of a, what journey has that per certain person taken so I'm saying that deliver justice if you can but if you have to deliver it in one day take away someone's freedom that's a colonizer's way the jails I mean, I don't know whether you saw the poster of my the flyer. I'll, I'll show you the flyer of my this colonization decolonization. Basically, I've made that those bars jails because that's what you gave us. And that is where we are still stuck. We are, how can you put someone in jail? You're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. Bail. I mean, bail is a something comes to a later stage. You've actually convicted a person by putting the person into jail for years. No, innocent up till proven guilty. No innocent person should be convicted, although hundreds of guilty people can go free. You've already convicted the guy on day one. He's inside the jail which is a colonizer's jail. That's not a condition someone should be living in who's, not, who's innocent. If you have convicted him already, then why are you just going through the process? <laughs> You've already done it. So I think we need to question all that. And like I said, you are the right person to do it. I mean, you, you've been out there. You, I mean, you, of course, in, in the legal profession, people know you. I think these are things, I don't, I don't think you should give up the PIL part of it. <laughs> these are things we need to take it because they're connected to mediation. It's connected to mediation because that's where they're going again. Now we've destroyed the the whole judiciary has destroyed the litigation part of it. Then destroyed arbitration. You know that where that went. Now mediation, you've touched it. Why do you want to finish off all options of dispute resolution for people? Let them be. I, I don't I don't know. You because look, I'm saying you're part of the system, so maybe we are we should not be discussing it. But I just feel that we need. I need to. Um. There is a need for transformation everywhere. This awareness to an intermediary should come at all levels. It, like I said, the African tribe, every member of the, the tribe is responsible about um, conflict. Every member of the community. The moment begins, they know what to do. Similarly, we in today's world, each one of us should be responsible about bringing in the, inter, uh, the, the consciousness of resolution, of 
communication. It's a, it's a different level of consciousness. And we all should take responsibility. Is it the government? Of course, the government should take responsibility and be, they should be the models to show how disputes can be resolved. The courts, they should take Section 89 seriously. And every judge, whenever he finds an element of settlement, should refer it for mediation. And let me tell you, as a mediator who's done hundreds of cases, 90% of the cases can be resolved. And that's the American experience. You know that. 90% have elements of settlement. We need good mediators. What about the media? The media has a responsibility. They are intermediaries between violence and the public consciousness. They are intermediaries. They should hold that space responsibly communities, neighborhoods. I think if all of us take responsibility for the third side act, as William Murray calls it, the third side act, our children, our colleges, schools, teach them how they can become intermediaries. Today we are collapsing how many cases pending. Let each of us, the government, the courts, the citizens, children, let us all be trained in being a good third side, a good intermediary. And all these confusions can be easily handled. No, because that's what I that's what I said. This the mediation circles that I was talking about. The idea is let's just go down there. Let's uh, but the only difference is that I you use the word train. I'm saying that they though they know everything about it. If we just have to create that whole in a way an atmosphere where they identify those people who they feel because it has to look i when someone says we will make a mediator i say the only people who can make a mediator are the people in dispute they are the only people who make mediators they will do, they have to decide and they between themselves have to decide who their mediator is so let's go down there ask them about those people and they'll they have names they already they give us names so they'll give us give us names and let's create a, a, a like i said circles so in that community they identify people now you create a circle around those people and i call these other people the peacemakers who will bring this whole thing to oh, the whole thing together and that's i think I, I mean that's the way i'm going about it because government judiciary is another world i don't touch that because i mean the brick walls are not good places to bang your heads on so let's just let them be <laughs> let them do because they're not going to the change is, i mean I'm, I'm sure there are progressive judges will come in and because the thing is this whole connection between the executive and the judiciary and whether they really are going to work together for changing things or are they going to be in tune with keeping that opaqueness there and all that so that's another whole nexus of things there but i think on the other side i think people and getting people involved and directly them doing what they have to and them understanding that that other world you're not going to get anywhere there. So just because look, other things that you come with, the ego and all that, all those things, that that person with the mediator mindset can handle. They know how to handle it. And they've been doing it. That's why the connection with this whole indigenous peoples and mediation in our culture and traditions that other symposium I did is that it is exists. But in certain places, yes, it has not been mediation. With even our panchayat system, everyone uses the panchayat when mediation is used in India. But are they doing mediation or are they they're just giving decisions to them what do they connect with what word should we use because i really like the fact that our arbitration conciliation act conciliation is translated as sule in that when we translated as sule sule yeah yeah the muslim yeah you know our yeah our translation in our act when it is translated in hindi oh. it is okay. the, uh, the a conciliation is translated as sule so they will connect to sule so I, the word that you have to connect them with has to be the right word, which is what the idea behind the large symposium on mediation in our culture and traditions. And this one was, what is it that they understand as that process? So I, what I did was I took the definition from the Singapore Convention and I put it out. A process, whatever name, however it is done. Only thing is that the third person should not have the authority to impose a solution. So now look at it from that perspective, what word fits into that process? And let's talk about that to the people. And we don't, because mediation is not a word that they need to even know. 
Why do they need to know it? It's a process that they have to know about. So let's put it across as a process because what's happening on the other side is that the whole this whole technical aspect that again it's connected to courts and something. Oh, this is another process which or oh, maybe it's uh, lawyers are required for it or whatever. So that connection that is being made in people's mind and it's not a good connection because I know that people don't come out. I mean, in terms of feedback, I don't know court system what feedback, but the people who tell me from the court system, it's not something that they would go and recommend to someone. It's that, oh, we were told to settle kind of thing. The, not good things are coming out there. I mean, I, when I hear about it, Jawad was there in one of my sessions and I told him, look, there's this mediator in the Supreme Court. And he, in an interview, said, the mediator will decide, the mediator will decide thrice in that. So maybe at that point of time, he didn't believe me. So I said, look, we'll cut this live stream. I'll show you that interview. Because sometimes it does happen that you might say Vikram just says it for effect. So I finished that session. I showed him that interview, all those clips, that this is exactly what the person said, because he was also talking about training and all said, look, this is a trained person. I mean, you call it training. This is what he says. He's, if he's telling us in that interview this, what is he doing in that room inside? <laughs> so what is it that people are taking back? It's that elephant and the blind man thing. What are people taking back as mediation, whether they even know, because it is their little experience in that room. That's mediation for them. But we might talk about it on a larger perspective outside. But for that user, that's all that is. And then he, when that person takes back into their families or relatives, community, this is what happened. This is mediation. It doesn't give a good name for mediation. Uh, Vikram, I do agree with you that there is no definite... definition, but there are some fundamental principles which would be really useful for a resolution, for a transformation, if that's what we're looking for. Every mediator, irrespective of what the community is, the country is, should create a safe space for the people in conflict. They should be able to make that connection because after all, this person, the mediator or the intermediary or the third, third side, you may call that person whatever you want, but should be able to achieve a safe space for the people struggling to come and find a solution. They should, so there are certain fundamental principles, which is the same. Creating a safe space, helping them with self-determination. It is self-determination. Looking at different ways, opening up choices for them reminding them of the common grounds, reminding them of the consequences or the impact, and then helping them to come to an informed decision. I do agree that you might say trade, but are you doing all these things? Are you being theoretical about your training? and you're not connecting with your uh, with the people who are in the room, then you're not trained. If you're not creating a safe space, you're not trained. These kind of aspects come intuitively to some. But they do better with a deeper understanding. Many do better with a deeper understanding of these concepts. So what the training is, just training is not enough. But are they achieving what mediation is supposed to achieve? That should be the criteria. Now what I'm, how I'm going about it is because, look, the thing is that I, of course, my limited time, because there's so much that I need to do. So I, ha I have conversations at different levels to understand. Because of that, if you have to take it forward, at least I've 
tested it myself rather than telling people on a theoretical level. So I have this village, some people from the village, these are teachers from the village I spoke to. The first I had to go through this because mediation had already been discussed with them. And of course, this person had connected it to the panchayat. And then they said, okay, the panchayat takes decisions. So mediator also takes decisions kind of thing. They, were, they did not have a clear idea. First, I had to differentiate that part. No, it doesn't take a decision. Then they gave names of people in that village who actually do the process. So they exist. So I know that. So now it's not that I, it's a theoretical concept that there's a people, we'll find these people. We know they're there. So now these people have the skill because finally, what is the concept of the whole thing? User experience. That's what we all work to. Even if you are doing trainings, you are going down to the user experience, engaging user experience through whatever mock mediations and everything that you do. So these people have already tested. They're already tested on that part. So let's take them. And I'm saying they know best because like I said, user experience is what is giving them, giving us those names. On the other end, that skill development is what maybe you're talking about so that yeah. skill, development, skill development yeah i mean training is just you know it can't be a mechanical process yeah. where but, you you do your 40 hours and then you're ready to do what you want no you do your 40 hours and it's an ongoing journey every day it's a journey to achieve these results yeah. that is a safe space connect to your parties open up their choices, help them come to informed decisions. Yeah. What, I'm, what I'm saying is that that aspect is that exists. And some places it has got lost also. But look, for me, right now, I look at India, the 600, the 60% rural population, we have about 900 million people living in villages in India. So let's, because that's a, that is India. I mean, we might, let's not disregard it as saying, okay, I mean, they don't know what they're doing and we'll tell them what to do. They know what they're doing. They must be doing it very well because we only have 18 million cases going into courts in India, while the US has 100 million going into courts. They've got something totally wrong. And they are the ones who are telling people around the world, telling people what mediation should be. So I think we have a problem there, which I'm also trying to put across that let's not take a, take whatever we get from somewhere and someone tells you dig a little deeper there see what's happening there in the last 40 45 years have they been able to push mediation in their own country how why are 100 million cases going into courts every year we are very lucky i'm saying 18 million is nothing for our population so maybe we are doing something right there let's go down to that and let's see and these people exist so i'm saying just pick them out and look, we, we've got YouTube, we've got all that, but that, that I'm bringing up, I have to decide whether we should put it out on YouTube, free resource. Sometimes I feel free resources are not valued as much. <laughs> that far. So that's why this mediation circles, I said, let's create, create a whole set of people whom we can then provide the skill development access to material. They don't have to pay for it, but at least something I'm, I'm just working that out. I'm saying, look, you don't have to pay for it, but you have to send me a gift because if you only if you appreciate the work I'm doing, only then you'll appreciate the World Mediation Circle. So I'm trying to fix it in some way because I'm saying free resources sometimes are not valued. I mean, imagine that the whole all those sessions you had with Ken Cloak. I mean, if was with him, people charge a good amount for people for people to come and listen to him. Today, there was a post, I mean, someone, I think the ABA, the American Bar Association put out a post as a session with Ken Cloak. And there's this girl from uh, Nigeria, she put a, a comment on it that I would have loved to see this, but I can't afford it. And I image put a reply to that. I said, there are, I think that now there are about 15 of those videos with Ken Cloak only. There's a whole playlist on my channel. I wrote there that, look, Ken Cloak's words of wisdom should not be limited to whether you can afford it or not. So you can watch this. And there are 400 plus videos lying on the channel, free resource. So I just found it very sad that a person like Ken Cloak with th that those words of wisdom to be limited to a few people only because of the money part of it, that's sad. So I did not, I don't want to go to that route also. I don't want to create a thing, the barrier for people to come in. So I, that is a little bit of a thing that are people valuing it or not, whether it's free. They're looking at something where someone charges what it's his words, words of wisdom that you want to listen to. So that part of it, I think I need to really understand people's psyche. That if it's coming for free, it's lying on a YouTube channel. So we won't value it only when you're paying for it. But, but that's, that's, I'm saying that what I've got to say is that there is, there are resources available for people for skill development. 
lots of resources available for skill development the only thing now is to be able to create a environment where this should become a kind of a occupation for them or i mean more than just doing it on a casual basis that they're doing i see in the villages and all is this person respected they go to that person it is mediation because which is what i found out it's still mediation there is not be, it's not being pushed on them like the other side the panchayat is doing because in the same conversation they spoke about how sometimes the panchayat even thrashes people to stick to their decisions so that contrast is there and people know that difference so i think that yeah, if, if it's informed decision making then that's it yeah parties i'm sorry participants should be um taking informed decisions free to choose free to choose kind of thing whether yeah. why they do it look i i have also been speaking about this look social pressure is not a bad thing if someone chooses some things based on the fact that community peace is something that is being looked at if someone tells you that this person who you respect and the person say look maybe the, the suggesting part of it that suggests that you can do it this way and you accept that yes this seems to be a good way only because i want to keep the community together that's not a bad thing sometimes it is look like again i said which there is a individualistic society which might throw things at you saying it's not a good thing you have to look at only your interest no don't do that i, I this whole approach now which i am talking about look this interest based thing i haven't read that book but a lot of people in the world read this book and this interest based thing because i don't read books generally but on the other side there is this whole humanistic approach that aspect of it like i said the values based morals based ethics based negotiation <clears throat> i'm calling it negotiation that part of it i don't think is being discussed because we are so fascinated by someone who wrote something based on what he understood as negotiation not a problem that's his it works for us as a society why not but let's not take it just like that let's question it but that's my only issue with books because someone writes something he might have changed his own mind on this today and if i was reading something on gandhi ji why again i don't read books but this particular book i've been wanting to read for years and i've started reading it he has written on village swaraj so i'm i'm looking at it from our village self sufficiency kind of thing so there he writes that look i can change my mind you read the latest that i've written <laughs> don't take everything i've written as gospel truth kind of thing so i think that's where the written part of it comes up because how many people are going to read the latest so that's why the videos that i put out i'm happier this way because of course people can see okay this is being said on so and so day i mean everyone's thoughts changes your thoughts change so now you're saying you said something say in the in the conference today you're saying something now you come in that symposium you'll have a certain thought your thoughts should you should be able to change it rather than stuck oh i wrote something it's a is a i've sold millions of copies now this is my thought no change it say no i don't i was went wrong there i think this is the way it should be people can't do that so i think let's not hold them to something that they said at some point of time let it be open come up with something else every it's an evolving thing your state of mind is evolving so i think people should but i but i, I don't i mean we, we've gone away from your childhood and those interesting things that you did but one thing before you before we go there on the section 89 i'm saying why this discrimination why don't you say mandatory you say mandatory mediation and everything why don't you say mandatory arbitration section 89 talks about arbitration also and why don't you pay that arbitrator the same thing that you pay the mediator in the court system why are you not looking at that why is that that the mediator is the one who has to suffer all the time mandatory arbitration can come out from section 89 also how come only me mandatory mediation came out of that i think that is you need to question that lala and you are the one who can do it it is you and i tell mr panchu i always tell mr panchu mr panchu you have to do this you have to have, you have to i mean whatever way you have to you are for someone who's out there people listen to you please talk about this i don't know what your thoughts on mandatory arbitration is when well, the parties agree to be arbitration then they they, they need to go for arbitration the parties the thing you heard what's happening in the world now na connected to mandatory mediation costs will be put on you based on what was your intention what whether you went into mediation with good faith or not all those things are being looked at now so now the point is that parties don't seem to have too much of a choice it's again down yeah. to that judge the whole concept of mandatory mediation came about because people really don't understand what mediation is and how much you try and explain it it's very difficult so 
if there is some compulsion for them to go to a mediator for a limited number of sessions, one or two, and at not heavy cost, the cost for those sessions is minimal. And you create an opportunity where they can understand what mediation is. That's all. That's all mandatory mediation should be. Okay, and but... An opportunity for them to understand what mediation is and leave at any point. And they, they can sit there for two minutes and say, no, we are not interested. Because sometimes the mediators are not worth listening to. But a good mediator at that point will be able to impress on the mind of the parties try mediation. You know, selling mediation is very tough. I've been in private mediation now since 2015. And I can tell you, it's not an easy job. As a lawyer, I only had to sell my services to one person. That's my client. As a mediator, I have to sell my services to two parties or to participants who are opponents and to two lawyers who are apprehensive of a diminishing revenue. So look at the challenge. It's very difficult to sell mediation. It comes much easier because when these very same four people are standing in front of a judge who has authority, who has the, the trust of these people, for him to say, go for one short session to a mediator and, and leave it. If you're not convinced, leave it. That has converted the Italian experience. 50% of them converted to voluntary mediation. I think the flaws in that system that I look at is that one, the connection between a process. Someone's come to the court because they want you to take a decision for them. And that's a whole thing that we can get into the psyche of people, why they do that. They don't, they don't want to take decisions themselves. So you've come to a court for that. And arbitration fits into the same process. Someone else takes a decision for it. So a connected process, first, at least send them for that. Revamp the whole system. First of all, why are you handling these matters? Uh, you, like you said, a judge says, go here, go for, try this process. It takes even five minutes of time. Uh, what is the on the other side? That five minutes can be used for someone who's sitting in jail and is innocent, like I said, is innocent, lying in jail because some matter did not be, it wasn't picked up because someone, a judge was sitting with some people who were in a divorce or who were fighting over some petty amount and telling them for that, I'm saying five minutes, I can go longer than that also, telling them why you should try mediation. You at the cost of someone else's life, someone's freedom. So I'm saying this is a waste of the judge's time, court's time, even talking about it. People should understand it as a process that is useful to them and all that part of it. Like I said, one chief justice or all the chief justices of each court also goes over in their own states. Let them fold their hands. They have to accept they've gone wrong. Something They have to take from the judiciary perspective. They have to somewhere as to our prime minister or our government for 20 years, if they sit on a matter, if, if the judges won't let it happen for 20 years. In one year, they'll say, why are you not looking at this person's matter? You can say, but they can sit on 20 years. So that part of it, I, I I'm saying that whole concept of what all the court should handle itself should be looked at. It's a look that was a colonizer's mindset. Colonizer wanted you to come to them for everything. Why should you be sitting together and settle it? I will decide what who will whom you'll go to. So that's a colonizer thing. We have to change from that. But I'm saying arbitration fits into what's the process they came for. So start with mandatory arbitration. At the same time keep telling people about mediation and do, let them do it outside the court system. They let not they be confused because why I'm saying that is because the moment you talk about mandatory arbitration of the whole section 89 and everything will get questioned. My that mediator who has a passion for mediation and wants to take it as, as a full time basis, which they can't because free and of course, very reasonable fees has got connected with mediation for them. I think that that will change. They will say yes. 
if the arbitrator that mandatory arbitration arbitrator has to be paid same as the mediator either the fees of the all of them will go up and why should the litigating lawyer get more amount let that also be fixed at the same term, the amount that the mediator gets in say the bangalore high, uh, mediation center i don't know what the people get there fix the same amount for the mandatory arbitration and for the litigating lawyer why are the mediators discriminated against i don't understand they're such and they're such nice people that they don't even say anything about it they accept it because they're so passionate about it they're happy that they're going into and settling someone's matter and making a difference in someone's life but okay they they have these nice concepts but don't take them for granted so fix the same fee everyone litigating lawyer arbitration mandatory arbitration mandatory mediation all of them across the board get the same amount everything will change your mediation center will close down the lawyers will not have anything happening there no mandatory arbitration will happen it's it's just the way that i think the the whole concept of mediation has gone and i you said that just go and sit in that meeting and then say no we don't want mediation it that's been questioned by courts i was just reading about the judgment i think it came from the uk they questioned that part that you didn't go there was not in good faith so costs aspect has come up it's going to go into absurd and more absurd things because they're two unconnected processes for your convenience you're sending it out for that but the foundation has to be strong you are in you are incompetent you are without the judge the system i'm not saying there are good judges in the country i'm not going to question the judges i'm the system is incompetent to handle this for so that your incompetence the whole whole concept of mediation is going to be finished i mean i'm just saying that it's not going to be and i always always been saying that a person when you tell them when it today not just court system even if they come to you on a private mediation always that connection that this will cost you so much in court and it will take so much time is what we mention it always is taken into account and that's not mediation that's still a person is settling because of those aspects which are not in their control you're putting a gun on their head to settle i think we have to do away with that courts should not be a reason and the time and the cost should not be a reason for you to settle they should be on more like i said the humanistic part of it collaborative aspect of it those are the good things we have to talk about in relation to how people should interact with each other and why should they be settling so i think that's getting lost in this whole picture and it will get even worse today at least luckily like i said we have a large rural population and good or bad whether some of them come into courts whether they can't afford to whatever reason is that that's a different thing we'll have to of course those are few studied but i'm just saying that that's an old chunk of 900 million people sitting there whom we can push a much better concept of mediation and let's not let this court thing reach there reach them that there is something happening there because i just feel that the, the only the fact that you take that route like i said in us 100 million cases for 300 million population we'll have how many we have one point was 1.4 billion people if the same percentage applies 400 500 million matters going into court and then going even if you are like you say 90% get settled to reach that 19% you'll have to put 400 million matters into court that's a collapse of a system that we can't handle 18 million what are we talking about other so i think a lot of things have to be revamped a whole civil procedure code 1908 I mean, what what world are we looking at? Let the colonizer go. We are not. We want to hang on to the colonizer. <laughs> so I find a lot very amusing when people want to talk about the Chief Justice of India wants to form a committee to look at the draft a mediation bill. What do you have to do with mediation? It's like uh, these. Uh, uh, I mean, these allopathic doctors. looking at let's look at ayurved and let's now put up a committee to look at how ayurved is going to function in the country you have nothing to do with it you handle your system leave this behind so i think we've we've been able to give them we give them too much leeway i think they want to get into everything and the government wanting to get into who your mediator should be hey, come off it who sitting in my house and whom i want to at you select like two parties are required trust in mediator is not just one person two two people so if two people have to trust someone definitely we, and they are smart no we are again the colonizer mindset that they are not smart enough we will tell you but this mm-hmm. I, we won't go into that I mean, this is ranting by for me and i should not i have been telling people that i don't know why i go into this direction always this is not that kind of a show this is about the nicer things about lela mm-hmm. so lela now we, we, i mean extra curricular was really not discussed extra curricular there has to be something more to it it can't be there i'm sure some interesting thing music dance all that 
No, I was not a great dancer, though I enjoy dancing a little bit now. I, I, I didn't have those kind of uh, skills uh, to become a great dancer. What Sorry. hobbies? Hobbies? Something? I'm sure there's some something interesting that you were doing. Yeah, no, I love. I always uh, enjoyed a bit of adventure, a bit of fun. Today we do a lot of traveling, so th th those are the kind of things that I do a little. I like to dabble in some kind of um, art or paint or those kind of things a little okay. bit, but nothing very seriously. No. That should be interesting, huh? Art, art is that? I mean, you actually sit I down. I enjoy and art. I, I look at creativity. I like my to do up my garden. Those kind of things I I, I enjoy. But otherwise, um, you know, I I I I'm not somebody who's done those spectacular um, activities. I, I've done a skydive, by the way. Yeah. Those, those <laughs> kind of things. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Or, or, or zip line, or uh, we do we do trekking. I've done um, the Camino walk. We did 120 kilometers. So I enjoy those kind of things. Yeah. So, so Lela, out of all that traveling today, if other than Bangalore, if there's some place that you would want to go and live in, which is that place going to be? I love the world. I we do a lot of traveling. We enjoy different places. But honestly, I like to come back to Bangalore. Oh, that's why I said I, knew, I, knew I love that. my home. I love that my was home. going to come for sure. So, <laughs> so that's why I'm saying, other than Bangalore, it, look, one is traveling. Okay, nice touristy place. We saw that monument and all that. But if no, I no, ask not, you, not much monument. I we go to the countryside. So the, we um uh, we we trek. Um, we enjoy the marketplaces, we enjoy the food. So those kind of experiences we like. So that, no, that's why I'm asking that. Me which place I'd like to go and live in? Live, yeah, live, yeah. I might, um, uh, in India? Anywhere, from India and abroad. I might like to go and live in Kodaiknath. That's a nice place. Yeah, and not in the town, in some slightly quiet, beautiful place, yeah. Because I mean, we didn't explore Kodai Canal too much. We went there, it's been some years now, but because we, we stayed at that golf course, played mm. golf, mm. went into town for some time. Not, mm. But it seemed like a much nicer hill station than what we've done to hill stations. I don't know about so the, the south. The town is really um, not the best, but if you go into the slightly uh, remote places, it's very beautiful. Look, I don't know about Kodai Canal of today, but I'm saying this is years back. You were not so bad. The town wasn't so bad. If you've seen what's happening, I don't know whether you want to put now it. It's, now it's really um, yeah. being, it's still quaint and nice, but it's busy, it's overcrowded, um, it's not so clean. But just go out of the town and it's nice. So I, I wouldn't mind going and living there for some time. But out, out of India, any specific place? Out of India, I always liked. Um, Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. Slovenia, and uh, um, yeah, I like Slovenia a lot. Some of those places are nice. Portugal, that's. But to, uh, but to live in, I mean, you'll live, to you'll live in. To live in, well, I. I wouldn't live anywhere there. I'd like to come back to India. Well, it has to be other than Bangalore. We have to move you out from India for a moment. For a moment. You have a choice. I mean, in the sense, you've just thought that lets me go and live somewhere else. And with all that experience that you had, is there one place that we can I identify? Can, if you insist, I can go and live anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no mandatory traveling, no mandatory thing. Just no, because it's very interesting to know that. Because I keep figuring this out. My wife keeps telling me, like, look, in Delhi has become the most polluted city in the world. Uh, I mean, we, we've gone that bad. Yeah. So we should be looking at that. Where? <laughs> look, that's the thing. You've lived in a city all your life. How do you? Do you I have told her. You tell me which place. <laughs> tell me. We will we'll go there. I have to live. I I go and live in your in US. My daughter lives there. I might live in the US. Might take a little uh, small house somewhere, um, not too far away from where she is, or That's... where some one of my family is there. And I'm quite happy um, making a home. 
So it's not place related; it's the people related. Who are who's the who are the people? So finally, it comes down to that. It seems. Yeah. Okay. So that I think is an important part of it because if we places. I don't know how much connection we really have to places. Even Bangalore, I mean, of course, with the way it must have expanded, I'm sure it's not Bangalore, Bangalore. Now it's that specific areas that you live in and you have you travel maybe because I, I'm sure, I don't know. I mean, for me, traveling in Bangalore seems to be really it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, nightmare so, total. So uh, we, my office is not far from where I live. It's just about say seven minutes, and uh, of course. Now virtual, my office is my home. I don't go every day to my office. So um, I like Bangalore. I like where I am. I have my friends around, family around. Our son lives close by. He and his wife. So Bangalore is good. Yeah, exactly. That's the Bangalore. I mean, that's that Bangalore. People yeah. say Bangalore. I, and the two, I every morning I walk in the two parks that I I work with. So it's beautiful. I do my 7,000 steps and um, I enjoy it. Exactly. I, mean, I can't ask for anything more. Exactly what I told my wife. Same thing for me. It's like for me, my golf course. If, if it's, I mean, earlier than seventeen minutes, it'll take me to get there. Coming back because traffic situation might take me twenty-five minutes. That's such a nice. And everything is online these days. All work is online. Such a nice. Yeah. Where would I want to go? I mean, I don't even know. Really, <laughs> I, I have everything that I need. I don't need a big move. I, I, I have no desire for very fancy things. So I'm comfortable. Exactly, I think that's that's the point. I mean, finally, it's down to that little. I I call it that little bubble. It's like I live in that little bubble of mine, and I'm happy in that bubble, and don't get these other because I I don't really read the news and also I don't yeah. even get that negative aspect into that bubble. Yeah. Like, I think that's quite nice. Yeah, I feel very blessed to be here, to have so much that life has offered. So it's okay. So I I, I look for me. Like I told you, time is never a factor, but I'm sure you have to decide whether you how much time you have. At any point of time, you can say, look, Vikram, I've had enough of you. You're ranting on this whole thing. I've had enough of that. It was not really required, but you went into it. I had to hear you because you were talking. You should tell me. The look, please. Any, any more questions which you feel would... Uh, look, I have lost... Would help me to understand myself better. No, I am still happy I'm to still, answer. No, I'm still trying to, I'm saying that let's pick up all these aspects of you growing up and everything and let's put a list on it. Tara's watching it and if she whenever she watches it, we'll ask her also to do it and to then put down uh, what makes a mediator. Because I like I said, this I keep saying I mean, we don't get offended. Okay, I mean I'll be using this terminology because you'll hear me saying it otherwise, so I'll use it here also. I said, look, 40 hour uh, factories don't make mediators, life makes mediators in what whatever they go through, circumstances, turning points, like look, like you said about turning point in your life. We had Mr. Panchu talking about his turning point in life and how he was trekking and how there was a polio virus which affected him, and how on that bed when he was, how things changed for him. And that, I mean, just takes a little something and changes your whole outlook on life. So for turning points and everything that goes with it. So I think we should put that down definitely as to then what, what are the other elements you would think that you've picked up over the years, which you feel the person that you are today, the mediator. I mean, let's, we're talking about the mediator part of it. The yeah. mediator that you are. Like I, let's go, let's, for a moment, let's just recap. One is, of course, boarding school. Being in a boarding school, new environment, being able, having to handle so many people, new people, creating relationships out there. I think that seems to be one. We definitely, we are picking up from there. Honesty aspect of it, whatever values-based education and all that you've got from the nuns, from a, the convent. I think very important foundation we created. So beyond that, then now, what else are we going to pick up? Well, my experience being a litigate. Uh, very, I, I just finished my law and um, at that point, my husband's business got caught in litigation. Um, so um, he was a young businessman. Uh, this is about 37, 38 years ago. I've, we were both that much younger. And um, I, um, so at that time, my father was a judge of the Supreme Court. 
So the moment this happened, you know, there was a stay order and his business, he couldn't continue that at that point. And it was terribly unfair. Somebody was trying to take advantage. So I called up my father in Delhi and he listened to me for a little while. And then he said, let me tell you something. It's important that you settle this as early as possible. My husband and I were furious to hear my father, who's sitting on the judgment seat the whole day, say that we should resolve a dispute which was so unfair to us. So we, we, we just couldn't accept that. Then he said, come to Delhi. So we went to Delhi. And then he said, go and meet some good lawyers and get their legal opinion. So we went to um, Mr. K.K. Venugopal. He looked at our case and he said, you have an excellent case. We came back home and my father said, yes, you may have an excellent case, but I'm telling you, resolve this as early as possible. But we didn't listen to him. We came back, continued the litigation. We got some very good lawyers in Bangalore and uh, we continued. Four years went by. My husband started, almost got into a depression because we owed money to the bank. We had several of our buyers harassing us. My children were young. They were not enjoying their father. And at that point, that is four years after the dispute started, we had gone up and down to the Supreme Court several times, the trial court, high court, then on interim applications, we went up to the Supreme Court. After four years, when I saw that his health was also suffering, I decided to somehow take some steps. And I mediated my own case at that time. I, I was very young. I was about 37 at that time, 37, 38. I mediated. It was not easy, but we settled the case. We gave an arm and a leg, but we got out of it. And today, by God's grace, we have really gone on to make our life. But that's a point I realized the pain of litigation. So I'm one of those lawyers who has also experienced the pain of litigation. And normally when I speak about um, mediation to lawyers, one of the questions I ask is, how many of you have actually suffered the pain of litigation? In a room of say three, 400 lawyers, it's not more than one or two who put up their hands. So they don't know the pain of litigation. So that has been a big factor to, um, to help me move into the space and to understand the space better. Often when I do mediation, I tell my parties, this has been my experience and this is how my father, who is sitting on the judgment seat every day, when it came to his daughter, he said, please settle this. Yeah. So you, you, the pain of litigation. Mm -hmm. So that, that's been an important factor for my journey. Then, of course, the, the loss of my son, uh, which really brought meaning, a very important part of my decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so that has been another Turning oh, but, that, but that period, I mean, that period must have been really tough. So how were you looking at handling it yourself? I mean, spirituality, what, what comes to your aid? Because I would, that's. It definitely is inner journey to be able to understand what is grief. To, how do I face grief? Uh, and to be able to, um, 
to, of course, spirituality, my faith. My faith has always stood strongly with me and, um, and I've been able to journey, journey that, yes. Because that's not easy, I mean, to be able to, those questions that must be coming within and all about life and everything, to be able to answer it, how do you do that? I don't know, must be, can't even imagine. You know, I, I don't believe that life is a mixed bag. I count my blessings. I, I've been blessed immensely. And when there has been this loss, uh, it, it, it was not easy. It, it's about 13 years. It was not easy. But when it, um, over the years, it's much less painful. But I'm, I'm able to, to see that one cannot just ask for the blessings. One has to ask for the sufferings of life also. And I've seen many good things come out of that also in the sense of, you know, empathy levels, compassion levels, um, the, the confidence to be myself, the courage. These are things that I feel enriched by. And um, of course, my, my inner journeys, my, my uh, the divine, presence, the divine um, will, accepting the divine will. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, like I said, it's an inner journey, which I mean, how you do it, how what happens within a person, yeah. I think it's your own yeah. way. Yeah. So things like, I mean, these are the things that I've said, these are things we need to I don't know, look, I'm not saying that you can remember all those things. I'm sure not. But I think each, every incident experience that you, like these are the big ones that you, of course, but there must be those smaller ones which we miss out on. And why I would, I mean, why I talk about it is because of a lot of people go through those experiences and maybe don't realize what they picked up from it. And that is what has made them, I mean, of course, we're talking about the mediator part of it. They haven't, they don't realize the, those aspects. And that's why I think, we, we should we try to try to see I mean whether we can or not how much you can go back into life and say what was the incident but the lesson you might remember but maybe the incident you might not but with you we'll we just want I just wanted to go back there to see if there's I mean in life what is really those things that you have experienced which have changed your thought process and you've looked at things from a totally different angle but that really helps because you have people sitting in front of you bearing their soul maybe maybe and to be able to connect to that part, to connect to them. One is, of course, look, one is experiencing, you can't experience everything, we can't. I mean, you can't. But I think to connect to that soul, certain aspects change the inner person that you are to be able to, maybe some layers go off. I don't know, because that's why that whole symposium on heart, soul, spirituality, what really happens there when you're connecting to the soul, to the heart, and listening to the heart, listening to the soul kind of thing, how does that really happen? And do those layers go away because of personal experiences when you can actually write, oh, I mean there's that core that you have reached and those layers have gone and so you're able to connect any thoughts on that I mean have you anything that you've thought about on this aspect it is when you journey within yourself you slowly are journeying to your true self and in your true self, you connect to the true self of the other. I mean, I always say this, namaste, the, the, the divine in me is connecting to the divine in you. So I have to connect to the divine in me to connect to the divine in you. So it is a journey inwards. Well, I'll just take one step here. One step ahead, I'll say connect to the divine in me and to be able to bring that divine there to connect with you. Sometimes I think the people... The have... moment you connect, if the if I'm able to... In, in mediation, we always talk about the aha moment. When is the aha moment? When the divine in me connects to the divine in you, then you can see magic happen for anybody. 
it can be a matrimonial dispute, family dispute. Um, it, 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 people just, I've seen God, I, you know, when I look back, I have seen God in my mediation moments. This you'll have to elaborate on. This one is interesting. This you'll have to elaborate. <laughs> I, I was doing a, a family dispute and 307 was involved, attempt to murder. The court sent it for mediation. It was a hard one to crack. After hours and hours of mediation, several sessions, I was able to make that breakthrough with the brother. And he said, I have got all this, no thanks to me. It came from my forefathers. And today, if I do anything to prejudice my brother, I am accountable. I'm accountable, accountable to my future generation, to our children, his children and my children. And for their sake, I accept all this. I'm willing to move on. He had tears in his eyes. I must confess, even I had tears in my eyes. But I can honestly tell you, I saw the divine. That's really important to talk about. I'm telling you, this is really important to talk about because this is something gets missed. I mean, just the fact that you can, you could have brought them to that point or brought him to that point to be able to connect to something so inner in the person. Is that, is that, I mean, you spoke about that energy part of it, the mediator bringing in that energy and all. I think that is important to discuss because it's not as easy as it might be. People might talk about mediators, I think. There's lots it's that not happen. easy at all, Vikram, as a mediator to reach that. You know, I'm, I'm inspired by that art installation I saw in the US. It is of two people metal frames of their skeleton, metal frames of their skeleton sitting back to back, crouched. Two skeletons sitting back to back, crouched. And inside those metal frames, you see two, two in each of those, in each of those metal frames, you see two children maybe uh, less than a year old, two little babies trying to reach out to each other. So within these metal frames, hard human beings exist a child who is trying to reach out to each other. This is so true. In fact, it is a painting that I have put up, the picture of it. I mean, it's a or in our office at camp. I see it all the time. Two metal solidified human beings sitting against crouching and sitting back to back opponents. But within each of them is a little child trying to reach out to the other. And if we access that, we have our aha moment. And that's what mediation training is all about. It's not the 40 hours and the opening statement and the private session and the joint session. It's really about unraveling that little child who's reaching out for connection. We're able to create that space that that inner child can come out first of all, and yeah. to be able to give that 
that basic thing that support that yes i am with you and you can come out and be who you are kind of thing yeah. which is i mean like i said these are things which sometimes i don't think get discussed which is important to be discussed which need to be out there because with that what will also happen is that you then value the mediators also and because sometimes what happens is like i keep saying that the mediator does what they do and you don't even know what happened <laughs> <laughs> what did the mediator do and the whole idea a good mediator is someone you don't even know what they did yeah so how yeah, do you... I, I remember a, a, a dear friend of mine an american um so here he he tells me you know when parties finish a mediation and leave without thanking you be happy celebrate because your skills have been so subtle they didn't even notice exactly that's really important i'm telling you seriously this is something that people would work the other way no it's like oh we did this kind of thing and that's i mean that's good enough i mean at the end of the day you got them to that point when they think they did it that's perfect but yes. it should not happen at the same time you should not stop valuing the mediator yeah. so the, yeah. the, the skills are very subtle and that's what brings out the child the vulnerable part of that person and you get to the ha mo but the thing is that i should still ask people to watch that media master mediators at work that your session because i won't ask you to repeat all that but i'm saying from that all that you've gave us examples of specific of course you didn't give names but specific people that you had in your mind but why not just kind of the highlights of it that these are things that you found as a common thread between them maybe you could just talk about that because i said that'd be a very good thing for people who are i mean what looking at mediation i'm not saying as participants or we could be looking at as participants also but generally who look at mediation and mediators a certain common thread in terms of characteristics and i think it hmm good question i thought all of them connected and connected to each one in the room some more some less i mean to some parties they connected more or pa- some participants they connected more to some lawyers they connected more to some less but there was this constant endeavor to connect to every member in that room next they they understood negotiation they understood negotiation as a communication as an interaction for agreement of course empathy, empathy is part of the first connect with empathy you connect they are uh, they had the mediator's mind what is a mediator's mind bruce edwards speaks about mediator's mind it's a beautiful concept they were this oasis of calmness and not really impacted by all the disturbances around they they were able to um hang the ego outside everybody else in the room had ego but not the mediator the mediator was able to hang his ego out
they were all very resilient. You, you know that mediators, uh, the messenger gets shot. And it requires resilience to stay there. Amazing. I saw that resilience. Persistence. <clears throat> really persistent. Didn't give up. I also noticed that all of them bring brought about a kind of, you know, they organized for the, the others, the participants and the lawyers. They organized. So parties in conflict come to the mediator slightly muddled. And why I say that is in conflict, we might be experts in every field. But when we are in conflict, there is a confusion. I saw that the, the mediator was able to, all these mediators, they organized the the process well, so that the parties felt, or the participants and the lawyers felt that they were on firm ground. So I think these were the kind of common features that I saw in the master mediators. Because you're also, you mentioned humility as part of that, I think. Mediator's mind. Yeah, that was important. Leave your ego out. Yeah. That's that's important for people to understand that because... Absolutely. You know, you're, the, you're the last person in the room and yet the first person in the room. Yeah. Because I think this whole thing of who is a mediator, because that's a question that will be asked as mediation is discussed a lot more in the country yeah. or in the world who is a mediator i think we might maybe we need to put all these down circulate it please add to this please add to this and then come out with something like who is a mediator yeah. mediation is meant for the the uh, the brave hearted and the open minded that's that's good that's we can use this we can use this one <laughs> Because I think I mean, because I'm telling you that you might we might within the mediation world talk about mediators and mediation. The world outside doesn't talk about it. It's not a world that they know about. So just the fact that you say mediator means nothing to them. Mediator means nothing to them. I'm saying that yes, if you connect it to culture and traditions and what we have been talking about, then maybe people with some look, some parts of the world, that aspect is gone. Maybe urbanization has affected it. So they won't even have those people in mind. Some people who are still connected to it, some generation might still connect to some people. So that's why I think who is a mediator, I think is also something which needs to be put yeah. up. It is a service leadership. Mediation is a service leadership. You're there only to serve those in conflict. So you're the last person in the room and yet the first person. Mediation is a paradox. It's really a paradox. You have to be soft and firm. You have to be um, stand tall and stand small. You, it's a constant paradox. That's the beauty of mediation. Exactly. That, that's, and it's not... I mean, it's not something that is easy for a mediator to go through. It's, it's lots that, like I said, I mean, the whole churning process that happens, that inner journey and other things. I think all those are really important to put and out. And why is it so complex? Because my question is, why is it so complex? It is complex because, sorry, because it is self-determination. You know, it's all very easy if you're not, if, the, if you are deciding. But to get to 
parties in conflict, to participants in conflict. To agree, to disagree is not easy. That's a tough job. Yeah. They agree to disagree, move on and find a solution. That's really tough. This I tell you at this aspect of making it easy that okay someone else will take a decision for us it's a global phenomenon that people just want to put it on someone else they don't want to take the responsibility of it I, you know i just sometimes think what a paradox that is i hear the wife saying he doesn't spend enough time with me so i want a divorce it's a paradox or he owes me 25 lakhs so I want to take him to court. Arbitration will cost me five lakhs. The remaining 10 years of my life and lawyer's fees, but he doesn't see that. He is so gripped by the right and wrong of it. He doesn't, you know, this is the strange part of mediation. Uh, of conflict, not mediation, okay. strange part of conflict that we we somehow lose track. But something let's let's also look at it from this perspective that maybe people don't have the right people around them who can help them in these at these times. Because finally it goes down to the same thing that oh, there is this thing, why don't you speak to this lawyer? And of course, once you've gone there, then things can only can I mean look. I mean, this is a general thing. I'm saying, and this exists. I'm not saying this. It's general, yes. The fact that you go to a lawyer, and chances are that you will be taken through this path, and you'll be shown a lot of things that oh, you have the best case. You know why should you settle, and this and that, and all those other things, all those games that are played around it. So they don't have any other person to go to when they have a dispute. So that I think we need to put these people out there, which is what I keep saying that people. They need to know that these people exist and bring them out. One is, of course, the casual one, the one in the family, where let's go and talk to this person. And we, these are people we need, but we have to, of course, develop it as something, as an occupation for them that we need to. But who do you think has the time today in families? Yeah. Each mediation, a complex mediation, a sport, not too much time. Complex mediation can take 40 to 50 hours. Or oh, get more, much more than that also. Yeah. So family members don't have the time. Yeah. And in today's world, it needs skills that are fine-tuned. Like all of us may have the, you know, intuitively we do have um, um, ability to be a doctor, to be an engineer, to be a lawyer, half the time home remedies. Uh, uh, I think a mother and a housewife will be constantly uh, a doctor or, or, or an engineer, you're fixing things, or a lawyer, you're arbitrating half the time. Similarly, a mediator, but there is another layer to it which is required. And that's why we need more conversations on how you can be a good intermediary, uh, more kind of um, active engagement by the community to, to become responsible third sides. But what has your experience been with the community? Because I'm sure you've engaged with communities and you've spoken about it. And so how has that worked? I mean, what has been your experience there? Not enough. I think our culture is to be polarized. But it's happening with more and more mediation awareness. I believe transformation will happen. And to a large extent, that is my um, objective now to work with, um, to at least in my, uh, well, you might say I'm in my thirties, 
the fact is I'm closer to 70s. Uh, so today I, I, I really hope that I get opportunities to do different kinds of mediation. So I can tell you, since I've, um, I, I've mediated a wide range of disputes and you know, whether it's commercial, um, breach of contract, family businesses, uh, companies, maritime disputes, sports disputes, um, labor law, um, between the union management and the union. Um, so I've, I've done a wide variety of disputes. And my hope is in the limited time I have, I want to show that this process is so powerful that it can work in different areas of conflict. I'm going to have a different thought process. I don't want Lela to be doing any mediation. I want you to be out there being able to take it out, to take it out to the people and get the numbers involved as participants and how we can create though that environment in communities through maybe, like I said, mass media and reach out to more people. Because look, the th fact is that all that experience to be used for that one dispute between some people, I don't want that to happen. That one, and all like wealth of experience to be used for community at large. Vikram, I can tell you after my 2005, uh, 15, 20, 17, no, yeah, 2006, 2016. So after my 14, 16 years of mediation, I think I'm a fairly good mediator, but I'm not a great orator. I'm not a great crowd puller. So don't you think my talents are better used no, no, if no, I mediate? No, we, people should know that these are what mediators are like because everyone might expect mediators because like I said, again, connected, Lela is also a lawyer. Look, like that whole stereotype of lawyers and the way they're supposed to conduct themselves, we have to break all that. She's a lawyer, but look at her. She's not, she's not, she's not loud. She, no, she has her way of going about it. So those stereotypes have to be broken. So, But I'm saying, look, the fact is that I'm saying that mediation circles in every community, there are mediation circles to be created in larger communities, like say the Bangalore business community at large will have within it certain communities where things are created. So when you go out and speak to them with your experience and of course, that we what you've worked and how it's worked for people and all that. And maybe some of them will be able to speak about it on, on those platforms. But again, to go out on you, that goes out on YouTube. Instead of, look, the point is, everyone has limited time on this planet. And if that, like with, with what I was giving you, the Ken Cloaks example, if those words of wisdom stay within those 20 people, I think it's a waste of that person's wealth of experience. So I'm saying that all that you are saying and everything gets broadcasted. It's available for your one session of that one hour or two hours that you spend with some people. That if it just gets circulated and it's out there available for people to see, you don't have to speak to people all the time. There's one session that gets goes out. And actually, you want, I mean, people get inspired. You don't even know. I mean, that one sentence of yours will just inspire someone, might change their thought process. In relation to dispute, everything that you are saying from your father being a Supreme Court lawyer telling you something from your experiences, all those aspects of it, and then seeing you as a person, meeting you as a person. Now they're meeting a mediator, which they have not met. <laughs> they haven't met a mediator. Suddenly now they're meeting a mediator and available to people all over the world to watch, to see. So that's the kind of thing that I feel that should needs to be created, which is I'm trying to create, which is what I'm trying to do, that let people listen to these people, see how special they are, which is what's got, got lost, I think. So how do we do that? Is God is no, 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 this, now is the time. <laughs> now is the time. So that's what you're going to do. I, which will, will work with me on this. We'll, look, I, this is a work in progress. I also, I'm speaking to people. I'm trying to see what needs to be worked out. This mediation circle has come out with after looking at what's happening globally, where the issues are, how we need to work on it. So all that. So with your experience, we'll add more things to it. We'll maybe refine it, retune it, whatever. So I think those are things which I feel that you should be doing. Because mediation you've done, you've seen, shown people, yes, it works. See, it works. Now we have enough examples of people who benefited from it and who can talk about it. 
but creating that at the because i really like as i asked you on the community level what are the difficulties you felt as to creating that environment that culture because i'm i am putting a lot on colonization i'm putting a lot there i'm saying that conditioning of the mind in relation to dispute resolution to undo that is not going to be easy dispute resolution happens in courts and lawyers are involved in it that's a whole thing that we have to break so it's not going to be easy it's hundreds of years of conditioning that we have to change so that's one thing i've looked at anything else that you feel is a impediment to developing it something that you after speaking to people trying to create some grassroots activity have you come across something which you feel is coming in the way so we do from camp we do a lot of work with community with training um and i put together a course on advocacy we've done several courses on advocacy mediation negotiation because negotiation is such an important part of mediation a good mediator is a good negotiator so um we train negotiation trainings then you know working awareness spreading vikram since 2006 as i said i thought i was committing a few hours of my week to uh, mediation but now it is 24 hours <laughs> i sleep breathe talk mediation all the time no but what is the feedback my that you get yeah. family has been very good of course let me tell you my my uh, role as a wife and as a mother and um daughter in law and daughter these are all very important um aspects to my being so um yeah a lot of my time is spent on mediation and um and camp there a lot of good work we have a very good team they are all working uh, relentlessly at this because i'm just thinking that to develop that culture of mediation what are the like i said what are the impediments to that so that we can work on those aspects and what is really coming in the way to develop a culture of mediation get part uh, the the uh, litigant population and the legal population the st- stakeholders to dispute resolution get them all familiar with mediation let them experience what mediation is in some way get them familiar then they then mindsets change i have seen mindsets change only with an actual experience of mediation yeah yeah that definitely changes the whole concept i mean yeah. people come out yeah. of it to very different very different because i actually put one out also one which which i said mediation works i had someone at who i there was a mediation that i did co mediation with mr panchu and i put it out and he says oh, look i am an evangelist of mediation now and large company general counsel saying that and it just sounds good and he i speak to him he always keeps talking about talking about two people about mediation and i hear from other people oh we were speaking to him and he had such nice things to say of course about me also <laughs> and about the process i said wow and i called him up i said directly you never tell me all this how can you tell these people that so that's what we need we just have to have good people out there talking about the process having good experiences i think having good experiences when parties have or when people have good experience of mediation then that's your best mindset change good experience if it's a difficult experience down the drain right because it was one good experience and that i think we have to we have a role to play we have to be a little careful on this because there was one mediation where i saw that this seems to be a place where the lawyers because look i have a big i have an issue with the of course you are doing mediation advocacy which is of course required on that end but here i am trying to develop it without the lawyers for the time being they can be involved as coming in as say experts on or talking about to say if there's some some very basic some aspects need to be clarified or whatever but i'm trying to develop it there because like i said that whole colonial concept of cutting that aspect out the courts and lawyers are not the ones that are required because the way i'm developing it is going to be at the grassroots level where lawyers first of all those people anyway are not going to be able to engage and if they are going to be able to engage them then that path is going to be more difficult to get them off 
So I'm trying to because look, it is. I mean, it's a little different because obviously the mediation world that we keep talking about is concentrating on a certain on certain kind of mediation at a certain level. Be it in relation to commercial mediation, there's a certain category of people or organizations that they're catering to. But there is a very large chunk that we need to touch, and as early as we can. So that's yes, where I'm absolutely. trying to. You know, when when the transformation happens at every level, when awareness comes to every level, um, and the experience, then you change the mindset. Today, it is a polarized mindset that is prevailing. It's, that's a natural, intuitive mindset today. But it can change. As the African proverb, a thousand spider webs can trap a lion. So let's create those thousand spider webs. Perfect. So that's what I'm going to give. My, my circles are going to be those web. We are creating a web. Now it's going to be called a web of mediation circles. <laughs> let's, not, let's use that terminology. It's going to be changed. I'm going to put it on my website. Now it's going to be web. It's not going to be, I had, I'd use the word network of mediation. Now it's going to be web. <laughs> that's, yeah. But look, I'm, why I go back to that colonization thing is because that divide and rule policy that was used, because only a colonizer needed to use that. So that is when you say polarization, because it's, there's a history of it. And that's the way you could handle no, all history, Vikram. It's intuition. Intuitively, we are combative. We are competitive. Intuitive. Oh and so only a mindset change. Colonization might have contributed to it. But intuitively, we are combative. No, I'll tell you I, why I'm going to disagree with you only because I had this experience in this symposium, someone from Nepal. Now, so Nepal, from Nepal, yeah. Nepal, and he lives in Thailand. Oh. Now, for him, for both these countries were not affected really by colonization because Bit British had created a protectorate kind of thing with Nepal, but it, there was no colonization. Now, he talks about his community where oh. everything happens on consensus. That's the way it's been in that community. And he talks about how now this whole political influence and politicians wanting to enter into their communities and changing the framework there. It's happening there. So now that is the colonization they're being affected by. This divide and rule that's coming up earlier, it was totally consensus, he says. So you must watch that. Prem, Prem Singh, he's, uh, uh, Prem Singh, you'll sign, I'll send you the link also. Is he a Weinstein fellow? No, no, no. He's, uh, he works with something called the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. So they're doing work there. So it was, it's really nice. I mean, just the fact that you hear that, yes, there is this whole community which has survived for all these years up till now. I mean, like he said, now with these politicians creating this that, okay, this person should be made your leader and this person should be made your leader, which was never an issue with them. And certain things from Thailand also we brought where there is that consensus building kind of thing happening. So I'm just saying naturally, maybe we are not like that. It's the concept of how that seed was put, put into us because we had to, I mean, look, a few thousand people ruling over millions of people. That's the only way you had. So that's what they did. So naturally, I think we, 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 we might not be like that. So I think we have an option available, but getting people back to that, back to that, we don't know how much back we have to go. <laughs> and there is no memory. There is no, definitely no generation is available to tell you. So one thing that is totally lost, you're creating something and that is going to it's be a the new future. consciousness. It's yes. a new consciousness. Yeah, exactly. That's so. Now we have to create. Exactly. And, you know, as I engage in mediation, why do you think I chose to become a full time mediator? I, I saw that uh, possibility, the key to peace. Exactly. It's a there, it's a there inside. It just has to be brought out. Yeah. That's, that's the important yeah. part. I, I, and that's why I decided to commit to being a full time mediator. So that's the thing. Whenever I, I tell people, look, on my shows, events, we never talk about this any negative aspect of it. We have to stay positive because I see that is whole positive thing about people available to us. Whether you can tap into it or not is your your expertise. But that is where everything lies. It's all there to tap into the human touch and all that aspect of it. And I'm saying this even high value commercial. 
I am talking about that. This that particular session that I said I put out there because it was the most complex matter. Everything there, fourteen years litigation, arbitration, everything. And at the end of the day, what did this person say? You brought the home, human touch, and I was very happy about that. I said that is something that you know, a few million dollars at stake, and you're still talking about it. That means people connect with people. They still connect, whatever yeah. be the situation. Absolutely, uh, I I had a mediation where the the court referred it. It was arbitration. Refer um, they had an arbitration clause and uh, section eleven, and the court said try mediation. They came kicking and screaming. They wanted to go back to arbitration. At the end of it, the uh, the, the the counsels and the parties said. Every commercial dispute should be resolved through mediation. At least, first try mediation, only then arbitration. One, uh, I think, one tenth of the cost, one hundredth of the time, and they settled it. And the and the mindset you come out of it, the positive yeah. mindset that you come out in terms of collaboration. And they continue and the relationship. Exactly. That whole just the positivity that is created around it, and you feel yeah. so good about that. That here you have people sitting there who are have. I mean, such a nice connection they've created. It's just, yeah. just it's it's something that of course seem to be believed, and people can't see it because it happens. And, and you so. see the benefit of it for a long time. There was a mediation I did uh, more than ten years ago, and. Um, Two months back, there was a big write-up on that company. It's a family, big family business, and I wrote to the C. Uh, the, the next generation has now come in, so I wrote to the person who's the current uh, head of the company, and I congratulated him on the success. And he said, "All this is possible because of the mediation." I think twelve years ago. Not bad. So, so yeah. Such validation so, to the whole process. Uh, after. After so many years, they they saw the impact of the mediation and the success that came after that. So really, in every branch of um, of dispute, whichever civil dispute, I think mediation is definitely recommended as the first step. Nuclear up um, uh, option later, but first try mediation. Then you go in for the nuclear option, which what is mediation. Mean? What I oh, put yeah. out is, yeah. what I put out is, look, the first step is sit together and resolve it. <laughs> I keep saying ah, that. Ideally, but if you can't do that, yeah, then bring you... in the third side. If you but... can't. No, because why I say that is even on my website I put out under mediation first I talk about this aspect of dispute resolution sit together and do it because of the fact that I keep here we say someone comes to a lawyer and they take you to litigation and but I we feel the responsibility should be to tell you to go for mediation same thing with mediator someone comes to you please sit down together and resolve it we, we it's our responsibility there also everything should not go into mediation is what how i put it of course sometimes what happens is you facilitate you facilitate a conversation and then send them off yeah. but okay now you yeah. and, and you know in order to have that facilitated conversation there should be that intermediary mindset or a, an approach to negotiation which is makes the disagreements more easily handled. But only thing is, to negotiate appropriate. Yeah, but the only thing is the thing is you can't be so decent. At some stage, you have to say, "Look, Vikram, I've had enough of you. <laughs> I know you're too polite to say that, <laughs> so I can say it. I can see. Look, it's been it's been long for you. Like I, with me, the problem is this that I'm so involved in the conversation. Time is not a factor." And I know on the other side you have polite people who can't say anything to you, so I need to bring it out to you. And these conversations will continue. It's not going to be the end of the conversations. Just like you say, I keep saying, this is the beginning. So yes, it has been. It's nine thirty. So we spent a good two and a half hours. Exactly, and this and is I, not. I, I hope you got something good out of it. Very good. I'm telling you, it's, it, I'm just saying that one session of yours with there and with this conversation, there is so much more, but. At the same time, these have to continue, and we have to take it forward to people, and we have to be able to bring out the good in them. <laughs> That's what we need to do. 
<laughs> Absolutely, Vikram. And, uh, you know, really thank you so much. And I wish you immense success in continuing conversations, collaborations, dialogues. Go thank out you. with it. All Thank you very much. And you have to be part of those things. Uh, people don't even know what the kinds of things I do because all those shows, events, and all of them keep happening. <laughs> there is a little too much out there. But please, if you get time, watch some of them. They've been really nice conversations like this one. They've been out there and and I keep getting feedback. People keep sending messages. I heard this and this touched me in this way or whatever. It just, it just They're just lying there. Let it be over years if someone has to watch it. Not a problem. But let's put these things out. So perfect. So and I'll take time for you on the colonization. What we'll do is let me finish this live stream and take time for you because let's just do this because it starts on 15 September. And if I leave it on the WhatsApp up and down, it might get lost. Like that particular email got lost where I said we'll do it on after that last symposium. So let's just do that. So thank you very much, Lela. Lovely talking to you. All the best. And All the of best. course, looking care. forward to doing creating mediation circles everywhere. So Absolutely. I'll just cut the light.